Hi everybody, it's Mrs. Cassill. We're going to get started on this in class, but just in case we don't have enough time to finish it, here's the complete recording, including how to prep and do your at-home lab. All right, so springs. This is one of the things we left out of forces and we haven't covered very thoroughly in energy. You did Khan Academy for this last week, but there might be some pieces that you still need to cover, so this is a perfect opportunity to review. So springs forces work and energy um, you'll notice it says the 11th on here because that's technically the day of the lab that you're going to be expected to do but you will get started on that today so our essential question is how much energy can a spring store uh, i'm going fast by the way remember this is a video so you can pause while you're writing you can rewind if you missed something i said you can fast forward if you've already seen this part or heard this part. You can change the speed of the video if I'm too slow or too fast. You can change the language of the video. Um, and uh, we, what else can you do? You can just mute me entirely also. So here's your do now. We did this in class, but here's some things to discuss and contemplate. So how does a spring store energy? Why don't you think about a spring? And we're not talking about a moving body of water. We're not talking about the season. We're talking about a mechanical spring, a coil of wire or other material. How does it store energy? I think you can agree they do store energy. How do they do that? A compressed spring is released, okay? So you take a spring, you smush it down, oh no! And its elastic potential energy transforms into... What kind of energy? Energy is conserved, so where does that energy go? It's no longer elastic potential energy. It's now what kind of energy? Springs are not the only objects that exhibit elastic qualities. List as many examples of things from your daily life that exhibit elastic qualities. This is an essential step because you will need to do this physically for your lab. Okay, take a minute, jot down your answers to those in your notebook. I'm going to continue on. So here's a little background about springs. So the whole point, what makes something a spring, is that it can be temporarily deformed, meaning it has a shape, but you can change that shape in a way that's temporary and one of the things that we'll talk about is the restoring force which will come up here in a minute that deformation can be stretching something so taking a you know rubber band and stretching it out so it becomes longer or compressing something taking something that can be smushed into a smaller size when this deformation occurs energy is stored springs vary in how much force is required to displace them from their equilibrium or rest position. There's a spring constant called K, I'm going to move my face for a second, bloop, 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 bloop. that is a measure of how much a spring resists that displacement. Something that's missing from this slide is really about taking Newton's third law and applying it to this situation here. If you measure how much force you have to apply in order to deform a spring some amount, then that energy that's there exerts an equal and opposite force, right? That, or that spring exerts an equal and opposite force. We call that a restoring force. So different types of springs have different restoring forces. I'm using this example of compressing something and saying, okay, I've displaced it this much, I've deformed it this much, so that's gonna exert a force going backwards the other way. But the same thing is true if I stretch something, right? If I take this and I stretch this, there's a restoring force that goes back as soon as I stop deforming it further. So here's a couple examples. What kind of spring constant do you think you have here? If, the, if K, spring constant is a measure of how much a spring resists displacement. A big K means a lot of resistance to displacement or deformation. A small K means a very little resistance. So we've got a slinky here, very little resistance. If you've ever played with a slinky, that's what makes them entirely fun and then also creates a uh, catastrophe as soon as soon as you accidentally tangle your slinky, right? Because they are very easy to move around. A bungee cord, you'll have to think about how those work really. In some ways, they have a very low resistance to deformation because 
they can stretch a lot. On the other hand, they are able to hold up a person and withstand the level of um, force that's involved in uh, stopping a person from falling. And there's a lot of kinetic energy um, in a person at the bottom of that swing there. So, um, you know, they're sort of in the middle, honestly, probably your, your spring constant. And we have an example here, like the shock absorbers on this motorcycle. So on a vehicle, we put very large springs and we want them to have incredible resistance to change in motion, um, to displacement, because they need to hold up the mass of a car, right? If your car was as bouncy and stretchy as a slinky, bad things would happen. So here's what you're doing this week. And I'm going to sort of walk through the lab here really quickly. And then I'm going to wrap up the notes that are here. And then I'll be available to answer more questions about your lab later this week. Right? For your lab, you're going to need to determine the spring constant, um, the coefficient of elasticity. We end up calling it the spring constant. Nobody calls it the coefficient of elasticity. But that's what it is. Just like a coefficient of friction. Right? It's a number going in front of a variable. It's a coefficient. It's a constant. It's a number. So you're going to use a spring. Okay? You might have a spring around your house. If you've got a pen that you could take apart that's got a little teeny spring in it that you're willing to sort of test, you might have some shocks from some of you who have cars that you've taken apart or put together. You can also use anything that can be used to store elastic potential energy. So my first suggestion for you is let's actually, instead of looking for something that can compress, look for something that can stretch. So a ponytail holder, which is what this is, a rubber band. Guess what? All my rubber bands in our house come from produce, right? Every time we get a bunch of broccoli or green onions, those rubber bands go in the drawer. So um, check around. See if in your in your refrigerator there might actually be a rubber band that could be utilized for science. I already said ponytail holder. Um, the elastic in the waistband of a pair of pants. Um, a tree branch that is something that you can reach out and hang on. Uh, there's lots of things that are elastic that can be temporarily pulled out of their position, that their shape can be temporarily changed. Um, honestly, I'd love to see somebody do this lab with a tree limb. That would just like make my day. So nobody get hurt, please. Here's what you're going to do. Your job is to figure out, okay, just how much does the item you choose resist that deformation? So you're going to use, if possible, you're going to use your finger, or you could use a pencil, I suppose, if you're worried your finger is too bendy. Actually, if you end up using a rubber band, which I imagine a lot of you will, a pen is a pretty nice thing to use because if it's got a little handle on there, you can actually kind of clip your rubber band in there, which will keep it from falling off the end and give you a little more experimental control. But we want to have a rubber band hanging vertically. You're going to hang an object with a known mass from your spring. Now some of you are going, dude, it's not a science classroom at my house. I don't have things with known mass. Um, do you have a can of beans somewhere in your house? Do you have a water bottle that holds 12 ounces of water that you could put different amounts in using a measuring cup? Do you have items that are you have in a set that you've got multiples of the same size. I'm talking fingernail polish containers. I'm talking children's toys. I'm talking books in the series of unfortunate events, right? Do you have things that you can use to estimate mass? Some of you have golf balls or, you know, stuff like that around the house. You might have all sorts of items. And believe it or not, if you bought it in a store, you can often look up what's the mass of that item on the interwebs. Okay? Now, for real calculations, you might need to convert those masses into kilograms. But guess what? If you take if you take my advice and you go digging through the pantry and you're like, cool, here's a little can of tomato paste. Oh, here's a big old can of beans. Uh, whatever it might be, you can actually see on there. It'll say how many ounces it or pounds it is, and then it will say how many grams is equivalent. Or you can look up how many 
grams is equivalent to that ounces and pounds. Grams divided by 1,000 is kilograms. So you'd be able to find the mass, a scientifically valid mass, for an object. Um, another thing, a way to look up the mass of things, in case this is like a super smart but sneaky way, right? We live in the day and age where you buy everything online. And if you want something to be shipped, the weight of that object often impacts the shipping price of it. So let's say that you don't know, like, um, you know, I've got my planner right here. I bought this on Amazon. If I go look up a listing for this planner on Amazon, I bet it will say what the weight of it is because it had to be used to actually calculate the shipping. So this is an object that otherwise, you know, it'd be silly to try to find the weight of, but you can probably find it on Amazon. So the whole idea is that you are going to hang different masses. So let's see, I can even get this to work with my planner since, you know, that's what I've got sitting around right here. So, and you're going to need to measure how much that object deforms your spring. Now, if like I just demonstrated, your effort actually, you know, over displaces your spring so it falls off or it can't stay on, you need to be a good scientist. You need to go, gosh, it's not that I don't understand physics, but this object is obviously too big for the rubber band that I picked. I better go find something smaller. You might need to think about, think like an engineer and go, well, I set up my equipment here according to my scientific procedure, but it fell apart in the middle. So how could I set this up more creatively? How could I attach this on there in a different way that's going to hold it in place instead of leaving me with an item falling off? So as you, you might need to do some of that good science there, um, but you're going to calculate how much force that hanging mass provides. Now it's going to be the force of gravity. This isn't an Atwood machine. There's no sneaky problem going on here, right? So the next thing you're going to do is measure and record the distance that your spring is temporarily deformed. If it's a tree branch, you need to measure where is it when it's at rest, and then you're going to measure how far down does it bend after you climb on it. If this is my rubber band right here, I feel like I'm pretty much at maximum with this particular um, sample that I grabbed right here, but I need to measure what's this total length right here. And then I'll want to take this off and measure the length of it while it's at rest. You could do that in any order, obviously. I'm doing it this way because that's what I was holding. So I'll have measured how much it was deformed um, by the mass of my planner hanging on it. And now I'm going to measure the length of it and find the difference between the two of those. That will tell me how much that spring has been temporarily deformed. You're going to repeat this process for as many different forces as you can provide. Now, in class, we would do 10, but that's because I've got real springs and sets of weights and stuff, right? So you don't necessarily have that luxury. Or if it's like this and you're using a ponytail holder, come on, it's not the most amazing spring. Finding things that vary in mass slightly in order to depress the, uh, to, um, the, what am I trying to say, deform this different incremental amounts, it's going to be really tricky. So follow your good, your middle school heart and go, cool, I'm going to do at least three different hanging masses. And then otherwise I can do, um, we'll be able to do 10 if, if that works for whatever spring you've chosen. Okay. You're going to plot a graph of force versus distance and find the best fit line. And I do mean mathematically we want to find what's the equation of that line this is straight up math skills here this is like second semester algebra one you've got this all right you're going to plot those points force on your y-axis distance on your x-axis those points will get plotted you're going to find a linear best fit line now what if like example this was really heavy right so you can imagine if I put a bowling ball on the bottom of this little ponytail holder and for some miraculous reason it didn't fall off, um, that it would probably stretch the same amount. So when I make a graph like that, I might see that the more force I apply, the greater the distance 
that my spring gets stretched, right? That makes sense. I can think through that logically. I predict that I will see that with my data. But if I reach a point where no matter how much force I apply, it always stretches the same, I've reached this vertical asymptote. I've reached a maximum for what my mechanical system can actually do. So at that point, that data isn't helpful, right? When you go to find your best fit line, if you've got somehow that your data is in a beautiful, nice little straight line, and then you got like a big old stack because you just tried putting more and more force on there and it stretched the same amount because it was already maximum stretched on your rubber band, delete that stuff. It's not helpful. You're absolutely looking for a trend that should have a slope, okay? Use your, use your good thinking brain. And then email me if you've got questions. I want to help with this. All right. Remember, you can pause, rewind, fast forward. You're watching the video. So you're going to find the slope of your best fit line. You're going to write that equation for your line in slope intercept form. Now, this actually is a great example of using math for a reason. All those times they made you find the equation of a line. This line actually has a name in physics. It's called Hooke's Law. It's written like this. Force and there's a little e for elastic, so an elastic force is equal to k times x. So x is the displacement from the rest position. So that difference between unstretched and stretched, what's that difference? That's your x. And f sub e is for elastic force. The slope of your line, if you look at this, what's going on here, right? Oh, sorry, it's kind of like vaguely off the screen. I'm going to drag my video, which always like gets crazy pants, sorry. The slope of your line is equal to the spring constant k. This is y equals mx plus b, where b is 0. Do you see that similarity in this linear equation here? So once you find the slope of your line, that's going to tell you just how darn elastic your ponytail holder is, or your tree branch, or that broccoli rubber band that you found in the bottom of the fridge, along with something else that you don't even know what it was because it was so shriveled up old and, you know, vaguely smelly, you didn't look twice at it, just snatched the rubber band and ran off and hoped that nobody would notice that you did that so you didn't have to be called back to clean it up. Not a real example from my own life. When you look at your graph again, Look at your axes, and I also want you to think about, we've got force on the y-axis, x, or distance or displacement, um, on the x-axis. Did I say y and x? Okay, I've got to get all my x's and f's and y's and x's right. So, if you find the area under the curve of your line, it's a straight line, it's going to make a triangle, okay? I know we say curve in math, and you're like, uh, it's a line, it's not curvy. Correct, you are right, okay? But there's a triangle. If you were to say, gosh, from minimum to maximum, I'm going to draw a vertical line, and I'm going to find out what's the area between my x-axis and the line there. You find that area. You're finding how much work is done by the spring. And remember, work is equal to the change in energy. That's what the work energy theorem says. So when you take something and you stretch it, I'm changing how much potential energy is in here. How did I do that? I did work. I applied a force over a distance in order to transform that work, that force, into stored energy. Pretty slick, right? So think about area of a triangle is one half times base times height. So think about the base of your triangle, your x axis is x for displacement, your y is f for force. So if we look at this, one half times x times f. Remember, this is the force of a spring, because we're using Newton's third law there to substitute that in. 1 half times x times kx, that was our force of a spring on your last page of notes. This tells us that the potential energy of a spring is equal to 1 half times that spring constant k times the amount it is displaced x squared, and that is equal to the work done 
by the spring. Angels are singing and sitting. We also did, so I just want to point out a couple math things for you here. One, we just used, this is calculus. You just did calculus. If any of you are not in calculus and you're like, I, what, what did I, what, why did we just do this? You just did calculus, okay? Just did an integral. It's pretty awesome. So you also used math and algebra that, you know, you were like, gosh, am I ever going to use this in real life? You used math from geometry to calculate an area. When am I ever going to use that in real life? All the time. Both of these things. And you also did those two things, algebra and geometry. You put them together, and it turns into calculus. So high five. You are all super math smart, okay? So here is there's a little review video that's here. Um, actually, I might have already assigned this one to you, so double check and see if we've got it there. And then your final task here is to write a paragraph explaining how much energy we can store in a spring using evidence from your lab today. Okay, I'm going to go back to this just a little bit to make sure that people understand what we're doing here. You're stretching a spring some amount. You're going to graph that to figure out what the spring constant K is. And then we've also derived two, uh, we've learned one equation, and we've derived another one using our graph. Just the equation for the potential energy in a spring and the work done by a spring, um, as well as Hooke's law, which is that the force of something elastic is equal to a spring constant, times how much that spring is deformed. Um, this is pretty good learning for springs, honestly. So um, have fun with your lab. Okay, I mean it. If you want to get crazy pants with this and go the extra mile, instead of hanging something vertically, you could actually launch something projectile instead and measure how far it goes. Do some like super layered math, right? To go, wait, if I know how far a projectile went that was in free fall, can I work backwards to figure out how fast it was going? If I know how fast it was going, I know what its kinetic energy was. If I know what its kinetic energy was, I can figure out what its elastic potential energy was. <sighs> and everybody bought mass to the party, so can't stop. So anyway, that's a that's an option, a, a different way to take this too if you want to play around with if any of you were dying for an excuse to launch rubber bands or build catapults at home, this is your opportunity to do so. That was a long explanation, but I hope that really helps. Um, have fun with your lab, and then reach out if you need help, you guys. I miss you every day that we're not together. <laughs>